work well. Um, one of the things that we ought to think about, since I think each of them try to kind of identify an important element of work in the school, uh, I think it may well kind of repay the school to also think that something may come out of the meeting, you know, possibly uh, a kind of <coughs> further meeting where perhaps more concrete details um, about really the, the school's position. When I say the school's position, um, I mean that in a sense differently from the position of each individual or the position of each unit. I think one of the real problems about the kind of transformation, first of all, of kind of practice uh, in the adoption of computer-aided design uh, and, and all the transformations in practice that were entailed by that, which then came to be sort of reflected in the early 90s um, by a move to the computer within the school, all that happened without a single debate in the school. This is, I think, the first time there's any been any kind of collective effort to try to kind of pool our experience. Um, now, I, I make these points really because in a sense people could discuss forever their own individual uh, take on the computer, their relation of their work to it, what they think indeed the role it should have in architectural education. But I think in a sense for the discussion today and discussions that follow on, the first thing we have to think about is really in terms of the school. Um, you know, there are so many different issues raised by the computer, <coughs> how we teach it, how that teaching should be delivered, what aspect of it should be delivered within the units, what aspect kind of outside, how we characterize the general architectural consequences of the transformation, what it means to have a kind of paperless kind of practice. Uh, I also think it bears on questions like, have we lost something? Uh, you know, what is, what is happening to drawing? What is happening to that kind of work in the 80s, which used to be referred to as like dirty work? Um, I think there are a whole series of questions. Now, I'm very pleased uh, to have persuaded both Mike Weinstock and Charles Tashima to come to begin to open up the discussion of these issues, obviously here uh, they need no introduction. So I'm going to ask them to make short presentations each uh, and then to take kind of questions and comments from the floor. Who's going to start? Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and start. Um, uh, Mike and I discussed uh, briefly um, as to how we wanted to organize it and um, I think we first were thinking of um, to make it a bit more of a lively debate to bring um, uh, the kind of um, a for and against but um, in many ways, after some discussion, we decided that um, you know it's a, it's a, a, a not really a kind of interesting way of approaching. Um, so then we both see ourselves as being wholeheartedly uh, committed to um, uh, digital media, and then we decide we tried to figure out a way of then um, approaching it in slightly different takes. So what we're going to do is it's in three parts. Uh, I'll first um, uh, present something and then, and then Mike and then we would like to also propose uh, back to the school um, various areas uh, where we can uh, begin to either further develop uh, certain changes that have already started to happen or to um, think about things that we would uh, actually want to change. So. Um, my approach, I'm, I'm unfortunately going to read it, uh, it's a bit uh, hopefully then clearer and, and quicker that way. Um, but the title of what I'm going to talk about, it's called uh, Towards Greater Integration. So I, I'm going to be presenting um, uh, basically in some ways looking uh, from uh, 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 trying to find an overlap of the media. and really seeing the computer as just uh, another tool or another instrument, another media in which to explore architectural ideas. So um, before I begin, uh, I would like to 
briefly say why um, I think I've been asked to speak here. Uh, because when I was first um, asked, I thought, well, you know, I'm not an authority on, on digital work, and I'm sure there are quite a number of people that are much more uh, engaged with it, or, um, I mean, I'm, I consider myself engaged with it, but coming much more um, deeply from within uh, the computer. So, and I think in some ways, um, my approach to um, the work has also a lot to do with my um, history at the school. Uh, I started teaching here in, in 1997, and um, over this time, I think, is the, the period of time where there was a mo most remarkable transformation. And it was very clearly seen by the, uh, the size of portfolios that were coming into the door uh, each year, uh, going from the A1, A0 format down to the now prevalent uh, A3 um, for obvious uh, convenient reasons uh, and uh, cost of, of the printer, and et cetera. So, um, um, there was hard, very, very few units that actually had uh, used a digital media, and this is in particular also the intermediate and first year levels. Um, and then now it's, it's flipped uh, the other way within the last seven years. Um, and um, what I'm going to say now has also to do, I, I feel that it should be something that's considered across the board. I don't think, I think there's certain elements that should be achieved in intermediate that's different than first year and that's different than the diploma school. But I think um, in general what I want to show or talk about in terms of integration has to do uh, across the board. So um, um, then after I kind of decided how I wanted to approach it, then I was trying to figure out, well, what do I say that's not somewhat already obvious uh, in terms of this relationship or the integra integration of the media. I mean, it's something that um, <coughs> has been talked about, you know, historically, whether it's through um, uh, um, other media such as the arts or uh, music, uh, dance, and, and bringing and figuring out ways of translating it into, uh, into architecture, that there's a, there's a form of a hybrid. Um, but I think uh, th it's something where um, the computer is not just about that. I think it's, a, it's also a medium that then allows, um, it acts, also acts as a, 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 a forum or a format where the media can actually meet. Um, so it's now been more than 20 years since the computer entered the architectural scene. Since its introduction, it has moved into a position of critical importance globally and without exception also at the AA. Needless to say, it is a moot point to question whether the commuter should or should not be used in architectural education. I really think we're many years beyond that. To make any claims against the computer would be nothing less than nostalgic and naive. While saying this, I still believe that it is important that some of us um, are also cautious to not fully embrace the media without, with a, f uh, a blind optimism. I say some of us uh, in the f uh, sense that some units should be allowed or should be uh, encouraged to make unquestioned leaps into the digital media despite uh, its perhaps foolhardy or naive um, approach. I think these are the pioneers and we need them. Then there are others of us that should provide forms of resistance. Here it is important that the school maintain a level of diversity to keep it vibrant and help push the computer's use forward creatively. This form of resistance comes in many forms. So I think there are three species of worker, uh, of tutors and students uh, and doers at the school. First, there are the, those pioneers that I've just mentioned. A, spec a second species are those that wish to remain outside entirely of, of the computer and operate uh, within other media, whether it's pencil, plaster, canvas, etc. In many ways, their obsessions are and should be of no different value than those immersed in the computer. And there are others, such as myself, who wish to define some line of mediation, bridging the gap of the various media. While embracing the computer, I believe that it is still critical that we question and evaluate its position in the school. As a matter of fact, in all three of these instances, um, it is important to consider oneself as a pioneer. So when I mention pioneer in the different media, it's not something just concerned with, um, with the computer, but also uh, whether it's uh, you know, these, the, the other more what would be considered traditional media. And I think it's a really excellent time to begin to question that and to begin to think also um, about the future of the school because I think these thoughts have many ways to do with how we envision ourselves uh, in the future. So I see in many ways the discussion today as an attempt 
at an evaluation and to make explicit what may already be apparently obvious, a dialogue in digital media. While the computer has been around for these 20 years, we are in many ways in a stage of early adolescence. Methods and techniques for not only representation, but also design elaboration and technical computation, as well as modes of conceptualization, conceptualization have much room for exploration. With an eye on what we have left behind, I would briefly like to explore and propose possible areas for this further advancement. The following is a claim for media integration um, and those that desire to integrate. Um, here I wish to present five areas regarding the relationship of the production of architecture and design process within a realm that seeks some form of mediation with physical media. And in order to do so, I'm identifying five areas that are uh, proclaimed by um, uh, more uh, traditional uh, formats of, of um, thinking. And they are uh, to consider the craft, the homogenizing effects of the computer, uh, size, uh, sketching and design process, and financial barriers. Uh, perhaps one of the biggest fears <coughs> in regards to craft um, is the use of digital media is the loss of uh, information or a loss of material um, that comes from physical uh, media. Um, I believe that this loss in the craft has to do with conceptions of a loss of reality. In effect, there is a belief that there has been a loss of information from within the material dimension. I don't think that this is true. I believe that the term craft, as we, um, as we know, can be enhanced through the media via the interface of digital media with materials, whatever they may be, either as so-called new materials or more traditional ones. In part, this has already been initiated at the school through the introduction of the CNC and laser cutter, but I don't think that this is the only avenue. I could easily imagine other forms of modeling and fabrication that may not even require such sophisticated machinery or automation. For example, it is possible to generate sections and plans from digital models and use as templates within more traditional means of fabrication. I also believe in the possibility of moving back and forth between digital and physical media. We should explore feedback loops between conception and production and back again. Uh, secondly, the homogenizing as effects of computer. Um, there's also the fear of the homogenizing tendencies of the computer, that the drawing as handwriting has lost it, the individuality of its signature. This may appear so, but I believe that the computer has simply not been tested in its potential. It is important that we still further test the diversity of the variables and attributes to create unexpected combinations. It has been said in, uh, that units have started to blend into each other. I've heard this on a number of occasions in reference to last year's exhibition. Um, there may have seemed to be overlaps, but if you look a bit closer among the various units, you can s uh, see approaches that are actually much more different than may originally or superficially appear. I think greater difference will be achieved in time as individual and units find their way through the media. When new technologies arise, there's a tendency first to work within the initiated formats but as these further develop, new avenues and approaches spawn and emerge. This takes time, and I think we're on the cusp of such change. Thirdly, size. The change towards greater use of digital media has reflected in the shrinking process. The size of portfolios have gone down from A0 and A1 formats to the now convenient and prevalent A3. I've witnessed this at the AA, as I've mentioned. Um, just uh, um, with this said, uh, there is no holding back from printing out larger drawings and even to draw on them. Ultimately, digital drawings are able to sustain even greater detail than hand drawings, um, especially if they're printed in a large format. I don't think that this has been tested yet at the school. Fourthly, uh, sketching and the design process. Many believe that the computer does not allow for an intuitive and spontaneous responses, those moments of inspiration. In answer to this, just because the computer has been introduced, what is to say that we'd have to stop sketching? In fact, why not explore <coughs> sketching also within 3D constructs? Design interpretation of the real in the context of emergence of virtual environments is a fantastic area for exploration. Traditional graphic media used to represent and manipulate space throughout the design process is limited. The traditional sketch is registered in only one fixed way. As usually, graphite on paper making it difficult for further manipulation. 
Digital media has opened up possibilities in the exploration of form and representation. The 3D computer sketch, however, can be manipulated and interpreted in a number of ways. Digital material is elastic, flexible, immaterial, and scaleless. The work, um, uh, actually I'll skip that and then go into the financial aspects. I mean, I think one of the barriers as well is, um, is a financial one. Um, and in many instances, the computer has financial barriers to achieve many of these things. While certainly the costs of the computer are higher than a piece of paper and pencil, I believe through resourcefulness and even additional funding uh, found for the school that these financial barriers can be significantly reduced. So in conclusion, this presentation has been nothing more than a claim for a consciousness in the movement toward greater integration of the media. There have been similar desires for overlap in the past, exploring the creation of media hybrids, whether from film to painting, music and culture. The computer is no exception here. In fact, the computer as the mediating media or canvas of exchange opens ever greater possibility to even more media working collectively and simultaneously. This is true at the design de development phase as well as within modes of fabrication and representation. It's in this area that the school um, is still in its adolescence in the exploration of mixing media more freely. We cannot think categorically as either or, but must further advance the both and. Design education should aspire to go beyond convention and search for new ideas and strategies. New technologies arise from new technology, new techniques arise from new technologies. It is essential that the architectural profession can take advantage of these changes by creating new specialities and extending its realm of expertise. The education of architecture within an innovative school as the AA wishes to be and is, um, is, we would like to examine how the AA itself can benefit from technological changes. How to most effectively deliver the content in the technological age remains a creative challenge. The AA must provide an exposure to a wide range of current and emerging techniques and foster individual approaches toward digital technology. This should be across the school, including first year and intermediate and not just in the diploma or graduate schools. Once a fluency in the language of digital is achieved, students will be able to better explore uncharted territories with greater fluency and creativity, defining in yet new and exciting chapters of the school's history. Thanks. Okay, um, I get to do the kind of techie bit, which is going to be less structured. Um, and at the end, we're both going to make a short series of proposals for both a pedagogic and a kind of spatial orientation in the school. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm roughly as old as computers are as we know them. And this is what a computer looked like when I was born. Um, and for my mother's generation, this is still in their mind what a computer is. And somehow it's kind of all of that is squeezed into this little box. Um, and what goes along with that kind of thinking is the idea um, that's quite widespread, but particularly that my mother has, that if you could only just learn how to turn this thing on, somehow the building and everything else will just kind of fall out of it. It's all computers nowadays. Somehow there isn't a, a kind of thinking or process attached to that. Um, this is the bomb. <coughs> it's just a tiny short bit of history. This is the decoding machine that Alan Turing invented. Turing was the mathematician. Most of you will have read somewhere that he's the kind of father of computing. Um, he was, you know, the great mathematical thinker uh, and his job was to uh, invent a process for um, decoding secret signals during World War II um, 
and this is kind of ri really quite amazing device, but it was supported by several hundred people who were divided up into uh, small rooms, eight people to a room, and this was spread over a, a huge park called Bletchley Park, and in some ways the formal plan of the computer grows out of that spatial arrangement. For most of you, like my sons, this is your first engagement with a computer. And the point uh, I want to make with that is, in the world at large, we treat computers in the same way as we treat electricity. It's just kind of there in the wall and we, we plug something in and we expect it all to work. Um, and everything we do in our life, we are totally enmeshed in this. The orange juice you have for breakfast, the clothes you're wearing, um, even the most ordinary, the production of the cup that Mark's drinking his coffee from. Everything in our physical world is integrated and organized through computation. And by and large, it's invisible, and pretty much that's, how the, way we, that's the way we want it. We're used to thinking of, in architecture, of computers being associated with very advanced design. Uh, this is Isimiyaki. Um, and that somehow that association still stays with us, and I believe it's kind of deeply problematic for architects. In the main, computers are not developed for architects. We are the smallest number of users of computers. And by a kind of deep irony, I managed to find this yesterday, this is a Mont Blanc pen, um, which those of people who fetishize handwriting, this is the kind of the pen to have for a great signature on, on your checkbook or um, signing contracts and so forth. And of course it's completely designed and produced uh, through co computational processes. I'm going to talk a little bit about simulation, the relation <coughs> of the physical world to what you can do on the computer and how those are organized. Uh, this is a flight simulation. I suppose in the days of the Wright brothers when you, you designed the plane and you, you went to the workshop and you cut all the wood and stuck the paper on it and two very brave people got in it and see if it would fly or not. Um, this is part of the process of the design development of the Harrier. It's quite an old simulation, but it is uh, a totally viable uh, flight simulation. It also maps um, the temperature of the exhausts and the turbulence generated. So quite a lot of the physical world can be simulated uh, in the digital world. This is a, a model of uh, gravitational waves. Again, in astrophysical terms, uh, 30 years ago, this would have required 30 A4 pages of mathematics. And this can be done in a few minutes now um, in, in a physics laboratory. We don't have in architecture softwares that will do this yet. This is a, a mapping of a light pattern through a curved surface. Typically, it's the kind of pattern that you see uh, on the bottom of a swimming pool or reflected through a window onto a wet surface. Um, but it's entirely digitally produced. And the process uh, <coughs> of the processes that we are not yet doing or bringing into architecture are already available and in wide use. This is um, in preparation for a, a brain operation where a surgeon will make a three-dimensional model of the tu tumor through a series of scans. That model is then, he wears a kind of eyepiece and that model is continually projected onto the area of the body that they're operating on. And it gives incredible accuracy. Um, and you can see on this one that the green bit is the tumor and the blue bit is the um, blood vessels around it. We can model things on the computer that um, are not visible to the eye. This is a, a three-dimensional model derived from an uh, electron microscope of a snail's tongue. Um, not all of you are going to be very interested in snail's tongues. But one of the important things about the computer, one of the gains, is it allows us to see and to model 
and to play with the structures of the world, of the physical world, and of biological active <laughs> mechanisms that are not available to other senses. So whilst, you know, in some, I w do agree that some things are lost with computation, and we were talking this morning uh, in another session about the physical joy of drawing and, and how therapeutic that can be and the kind of era that I grew up in where <laughs> as a draftsman I would be given two weeks to make a drawing uh, in an office. It, it, might, it was three meters long sometimes. But, and certainly that's a loss. But what is gained is the knowledge of an ability to interact with the physical structures of the world below the level of which they can be sensed. This, for example, is a digital model of the structure at a molecular level of ice. And the knowledge that comes with that is, we can see it's a porous structure and that's why it floats. So even the, the simple thing of knowing why ice, which is heavier than water, floats, it, it's kind of, uh, there's an available set of knowledge and techniques that just are not possible without the computer. Um, the these few sequences are a little bit of a design process that follows from what Cecil Baumann called a kind of choreographed line. This image uh, is probably quite familiar to most of you. Uh, it was part of the Shabazz Park proposal for a roof. But typically when we're thinking about construction, um, we can make these kind of surface models and, and they're not fixed in the way that a, a drawing was fixed. So each one of the control points can be moved and you can change the form and it will kind of automatically adjust itself. When I was a draftsman, that would be kind of several weeks work for three or four people, because if you wanted to change one curve, you had to change the, uh, reproduce and rework all, all the other drawings. So another gain is the kind of compression of time that used to be put into the production and development of pursuing an idea. And of course, we can directly output them to physical models. What comes along with that is an attitude that develops, which I think is a totally different mindset from uh, a, an architecture or a design that's pursued from, uh, in, in the older way, from the sketch. That is, that there's one kind of brilliant idea that comes in a moment of inspiration, and that uh, all the work that follows after that is somehow dealing with the material and the economics and all, all the different people to bring that single idea to production. In a computational world, one works in the opposite direction by throwing up huge number of related ideas, variants of forms, and from that choosing one to uh, put into production. Charles talked uh, and mentioned about the integration and with what we're both very passionate about is to find and develop ways to unite physical ways of working with computational ways. And in architecture that we um, have a very short history of form finding through physical models, of stressing bits of material uh, until they arrive at a kind of stable shape. Um, and we can still do that. This is from a workshop last year by uh, which Fry Otto's daughter helped us. And it's a very simple thing of joining bits of things together, letting them hang, and when they find a stable form, turning it upside down, and it's structurally viable. And again, the f you know, this is a physical experiment with minimal surfaces by stretching bits of fabric uh, and stressing them. This is a, a small movie that I've made with one mathematical sentence. Okay. So the effort here is not to, to write a form or to design a form, but to make a small piece of mathematics that will generate uh, a form that moves over time. And it's stuck. <laughs> um, this will just take a second, I hope. Um, the process is and the interest in com computation has come without any pedagogical structure to it. We have a very ad hoc way of teaching computation in this school, as does every other school that I know of. 
We do these kind of crash courses at the beginning of the year. Um, they last a week or two weeks, and after that you're all kind of expected to be expert at it. One of the things we want to address today is what are, uh, if we're going to have a more intensive engagement with co computers, what are the pedagogical consequences? Do we have to rethink the whole of first year? Do we have to rethink um, the spaces of the school and how it's taught? Joel, I don't know if you could have any idea how, how I can get out of this loop. <laughs> I don't know if that has. I think I've loaded too big a, a file into that. <coughs> I'll just go down to that image. Yeah. Another set of form finding experiments which are physical. And what we're looking for is to develop within our own research programs in this school ways of linking these physical experiments with the digital world. And we hope that, uh, that there's kind of iterative process that we can set forth doing with that. In the past, this has always involved kind of huge, clunky bits of equipment. Most of those former processes now have digital equipment, uh, equivalents. Uh, this is um, what's called finite element analysis, where you can look at a kind of piece of a building and see which bits are doing more structural work than others and what happens if you add something into it. So you can see in the lower image that uh, another wall's been put in and you can see the change in the physical work that's being done. In the professional world, all of these processes are what officers expect you to be able to do. Um, so this is from um, um, the Eden Project in Cornwall, and you can see that it's, a, it, it's an image from a dynamic model. What happens when you have a form and you, uh, you have a load of snow on it, or, or the load condition changes on it, and you can plot and predict all, all the movements of the structure. Most physical artifacts in the world are produced through computational controlled uh, manufacturing. What we tend to do in architecture, and this is a small project from this school, is set up some kind of physical test which we can then use to uh, produce a, a digital version, go back to a physical thing to see if we were right, and then kind of extend that out into an architectural project. Increasingly, we're also using what are modeling techniques, this is from a laser cutter, which were big industry techniques which are being shrunk down and down until we can have them on our, our desktop. What comes with that, with the idea of dynamics, is an interest in architectures which are not static. Uh, and looking at methods of control that can be embedded in uh, physical processes. And that we'll have buildings that have digital interfaces or are intelligent in themselves and can control their movements. This uses the same piece of mathematics, the same algorithm that's used to produce the light from a water surface, of mapping uh, a structural idea onto a surface, in this case, kind of pieces or truncated pieces of a cone, and then return to the laser cutter in the cycle to see what its physical nature is. Some of you will remember this particular one from the bar last year. Earlier this morning, we've been um, looking at shipyard production systems that are used in architecture. Most of the technologies that are to do with the production of physical systems exist outside of architecture. Technology, although we think of ourselves as technologists, technology is not invented for architecture or for architects. And in fact, we're the, in numerical terms, the smallest client for it. But there's a lot to be gained by engaging in other industries. Uh, this is from the Pendennis Shipyard for the, the shell of the media center. We can also explore ideas that come from within our own history. So this is a glass tensegrity structure. Some of you will know a little bit about Buckminster Fuller and tensegrity stuff. It's kind of sticks and strings. Um, and it has very interesting uh, structural ideas which very few people have ever been able to do anything with. But we can bring those now and simulate those within the computer. 
this is within a very ordinary software, I think it's in Maya, where the, um, you literally create a number of uh, springs which have, uh, can have a resistance, and you can use those so that the uh, springs are set up they're within that cube, and you can find an equilibrium which will generate uh, a set of tensegrity forms for it. And using the same techniques that we use for uh, the light mapping and for the cones, you can map those onto surfaces. This is where I start a little bit about the proposals of what we would like to bring to the school. Um, and this is the next two images are about things that we want to build this year or start building this year at Hook Park. Um, this is a heliodome, which is a physical space in which you can put a model of a, a physical model of a building. Um, and test out various light conditions, you know, reflectance, and, and so forth from any part of the world at any, any time of day or night. It's interfaced by, uh, with a computer and its output is with a computer. We also want to build a wind tunnel, nothing as grand as this, uh, which I think is kind of very amazing looking. Um, and we're going to have a kind of slightly sm smaller one than that. Um, but what we want to do is to not only in a design sense produce this integration but to develop a set of facilities that relate physical testing and physical development with digital evolution. Okay Charles, so shall we go to our proposals? All right, well, um, we'll just start. I mean, we, um, we're talking about, I mean, a lot of these, we probably have about five or six um, various areas. Just, again, as, as Mark said, um, something that we see now is just introducing into the air and then something that needs to probably be talked about in, in greater detail. Um, and some of the thoughts are also um, <coughs> speculative and... Um, yeah, might go beyond the means of, of the school, but I think it's important to mention them. I mean, the first uh, point that we were talking um, yesterday was um, the introduction of more studio spaces on the um, perhaps similar model as the graduate school, that some of the rooms um, would um, have, they would actually act more as, um, uh, they would have computers within them, and then they would be acting more as, as laboratories. Do you want to add to that? Yeah. If we're going to have a more intensive engagement with computation and with physical processes, it follows that the pedagogical structure has to be revised. So the first part of our proposal is that unit teaching becomes studio-based and that each uh, studio has within it not only your own personal uh, laptops but some, uh, a server. I know we have a kind of wireless network at the moment but where each studio would have its own software suite and its own set of uh, facilities for the particular direction that the, the unit wishes to explore. Um, the second area is, um, I guess maybe I'll, I'll continue with the second point, which would be um, just considering the further infrastructure within the school is that um, in terms of accessibility to printers, also larger printers, um, thinking about also alternative ways of uh, uh, funding uh, to acquire them. I think... Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that would include kind of desktop printers, uh, which are now kind of affordable at a studio level. Um, laser cutting and CNC at the moment is a kind of highly specialized, privileged thing with, with its own sets of roo rooms, but... Uh, there are ways to incorporate that as much more as a kind of studio-based practice. Um, and then also um, reconsideration of various courses, um, for example in the uh, communication studies um, as well as um, general studies. Um, so in the communication studies to bring in uh, possibly, um, I mean again it's not something where, um, as I was mentioning earlier, to uh, to completely convert things, but that there is um, perhaps more of a balance uh, that this possibility of, of integration is uh, enabled. And also in terms of um, uh, defining ways of bringing it into the history and theory of, um, of architecture. 
And, and perhaps more controversially, what I would like to kind of put forward as an item for discussion is that first year and second year, the whole of their pedagogical structure, the curriculum is rewritten for a much more profound engagement with physical experimentation and digital work. That would actually mean um, reinventing not only the kind of what used to be called the service units of general studies, technical studies and communication, but actually the, what is the nature of what a first year program should be. <laughs> right, Joe. So we're ready for questions. Okay, well, I, <clears throat> I mean, in a way, I think the, the, the presentation has been extremely interesting, um, but it, it sort of confronts us with a difficulty. One is we have uh, rather little time uh, left for discussion. And I think the second issue is really uh, that taken together, um, Charles and Mike's contribution constitutes a kind of very definite um, proposal. Now, uh, perhaps at this point, if, if they would agree, uh, we might kind of think of setting up some kind of working party to be kind of chaired by them, and that anyone from here uh, who would like to contribute to that uh, should um, kind of give their names to Belinda so that they can be kind of communicating with. Is that, would that be kind of acceptable? Because I think in a sense that puts then to one side a detailed discussion of your proposal which in a sense we can't generate uh, in the time left. On the other hand, you know, it may be that people from the floor want to sort of take a further step backwards. Um, to look at kind of more general issues uh, of the introduction. It seems to me if that working party is, is to kind of uh, work, it still needs to be based on a more kind of thoroughgoing discussion, including kind of other points of view. So could we start? between the laboratories and the studios. And I was put on this design team to do a wired workstation where you actually had a kind of studio desk hybridized with a laptop thing that pulled out and storage and whatnot. So I think, you know, to point out both of you are into this integration, I mean, it has to happen. And, you know, obviously money's an issue, but, you know, laptops are becoming more and more uh, inexpensive. And also, obviously, Texas University, this is a private university, and funds are a problem. Uh, sometimes a technology fee that's just for technology whether it's printing or printers or computers or IT people, uh, that could be a separate fee in and of itself. Um, I don't know if that has happened in the past or could happen um, in terms of funding, but I think integration is probably the most important thing in terms of trying to bridge that gap. So. Was Mark looking? Mark? Oh, I thought you wanted. What? <laughs> That's unusual. <laughs> kind of physical aspects of architecture, but I think there's another whole area which is about that subjects which, such as demographics and economics, are also part of the whole digital revolution. And basically, it's introduced colour back into drafting, which I think is fantastic. The day I threw away my rotary pens. Another question. Well, maybe if I could sort of try and bend the stick back the other way. Um, I mean, it, it would seem to me that, that to carry the discussion further <coughs> really needs to kind of track back uh, in terms of the introduction of the computer and, for example, in terms of what Mike's saying, is really to ask polemically, you know, what's, what's the relationship between that and architecture? Um, you know, the, the, it's perfectly possible and kind of legitimate 
to think that one of the problems in architectural schools and in architecture in general is that the immense possibilities opened up uh, by the computer nonetheless brought in a kind of technicization uh, of architecture. I'm not saying I, I think this, but to take a kind of simple uh, example, the possibility of making complex non-traditional calculations was surely not only the condition, but to some extent the cause of the appearance of a sort of architecture which requires that. Um, that is to say, you know, that on the one hand, it would be difficult to imagine, say, uh, the Bilbao um, gallery, you know, without it being the sort of materialization of a set of possibilities which had only been available for a relatively short time. I think also that the question kind of bears on the whole interest in form. It seems to me that you know, it has to be taken seriously that the sort of interest in complexity and a new generation of interest in morphogenesis uh, in the 90s was itself premised uh, on the development of possibilities of computation, in a sense would make no sense without it. Now, you know, if that's true, there's still, it seems to me, an argument to be made for raising the architectural question of why you would want to go down this route. I mean, since no one else in the audience has put the question, it falls to me to do so. Well, uh, I think I'd respond to that by saying, of course, it's, you're right, and it's perfectly possible to do architecture, uh, at least most of it, without a computer. I think the points we're making are that uh, w not that we should compel absolutely everybody to use it, but if it's ever going to transcend um, its f current use, if it's ever going to be an instrument which has um, a potential for producing a unique computationally based architecture which is kind of sensitive and responsive and in some sense alive, then that requires a much deeper engagement. At, at the moment, we're, we're quite superficial, I think, in the ways that we use the computer. And we have some kind of, some areas more experimental. I think also the area that Charles touched on a little bit, um, the production of film, of um, kind of narrative structures and sequences of, of space, can be conceived independently uh, uh, of a computer. But a computer will uh, inevitably make the production and, and the materialization of that a much more kind of satisfactory and efficient process for the person doing it. So it's not that it's all going to be kind of, you know, wobbly forms and, and uh, lots of things with little holes in that look as though they don't stand up but are actually really strong. Um, in some ways, I think computers are only just finishing a kind of imitation phase which is true historically of any new technology. If you look at kind of Greek temples, the kind of early ones, in some sense, look very much like wooden structures, and they've got the same kind of structural logic and so forth. And you, you, with telephones and, and all sorts of things, you can see that same kind of phase transition of the first phase is always a kind of imitation and a more efficient way of doing something that used to be done in the past. So I wouldn't like to say what the future of architecture is in relation to computation. But I certainly think it opens up very much wider than the area of work that I personally do, which is kind of the maths and the uh, material, materialization and structures. And perhaps its most interesting uh, time will come when the computation is invisible. When you have softwares that you don't particularly have to engage with, when you don't have to know, uh, for example, when you plug in your hairdryer or your toaster, you know, th th these are not operations that you have to think about how they work. And ultimately, kind of with the direction of pers personal computers and personal computations, I would hope that would be a kind of longer term destiny. 
I don't know if that's an answer or not. Maybe a bit of a rant. Someone at the back there. Hello. Um, I'm actually not a student of this school, but I went to see a couple of the final year shows. And uh, what always struck me is that um, the projects that are produced um, show a lot of um, success when it comes to surfaces and patterns. And these surfaces are um, usually generated by the computer. But then when it comes to synthesizing spaces from these surfaces, then it is much less successful. And I guess that is because in the computer it's very easy to multiply a certain um, figure. And um, what, what I'm missing is, for example, either the reason why things are multiplied. I'm thinking of this um, um, hothouse scheme for the Netherlands where the same pattern has just been spread across the whole country without really saying um, why. And also how um, spaces can be created from these um, surfaces more successfully with the computer. Because sometimes um, a pattern becomes an object in itself and then um, it doesn't really become <coughs> architecture with the complexity that can be achieved with um, non-computational methods. I mean, you know, in, in answer to that, I mean, I think that's also the point of largely of what we're talking about in terms of, I mean, we, we both, um, as well as most everyone here, is that I, um, you know, in terms of the development of using digital media at the AA is still in its adolescence. I think there are a lot of things that have not been dealt, and I think some of the uh, images shown by Mike were quite poignant in terms of uh, urging or, uh, or showing the possibilities of this translation um, from these, um, you know, so-called virtual spaces. Um, and there's also not another thing to say is in terms of this, the element of the iteration. Yeah, that's a general, I mean, that's <coughs> a, it's a kind of um, mechanism that comes out of it and is one attribute. And uh, what I had said earlier um, is that in many ways there is this level of imitation or there is this element of redundancy or um, uh, in terms of doing things with the computer. But that's, you know, still because it's, it's like a new toy in a lot of ways. I mean, I think toy is probably even a bad word to use in that sense because it, makes it seem more like it's just um, um, you know, something just to you know, play around with. But I think um, it is important that it does move in that. I mean, a question that I would throw back to you then is that you know, would you ever even been able to generate that form <coughs> with, with the holes and the virtual image uh, without it? You know? And I would say no. Um, so I think I'd rather be in the position where we are now where maybe it is a bit some of the work that's coming out is um, maybe not at the satisfactory level, but I'd rather be approaching it this way um, than, than not at all. And, uh, you know, Frederick Kiesler was doing, we're doing these forms without a computer. I mean, I, I don't know. I just uh, I find that you can do a lot more things besides what MTech's doing, as well. And I think there's just larger issues at hand instead of just kind of, you know, jumping on stylistic uh, form debate. Valentine, and then I think we're going to. Uh, I mean, people have to go off to teach or be taught. Uh, I'm, this I'm doesn't necessarily kind of indicate. Who's doing what? Who does what? <laughs> uh, Valentin, I teach in first year. Um, I think it's a bit, I feel it's very general, the debate, and I'm not sure if we actually have identified what the computer does and what the other stuff, I'm not sure what we're talking about, does. But I think it's much more important to kind of um, find out or define what we're looking for and how we're going to do that and what tools we're using in order to achieve that. And I. I feel, um, I mean, your example with the heliodome being a computer, uh, computational model uh, makes me, <coughs> you know, more confused because I'm not sure why you want to build that, that uh, heliodome um, because it is a computer, uh, a more accurate way of mapping something with a computer or is it because 
you want to do that uh, because you need the physical light in order to see something that you can't see in a computer model. And I think these discussions would be much more interesting uh, rather than saying one is more appropriate than the other one. And maybe it would be also interesting to look at other examples in history of how maybe a type of technology or mechanism has actually changed our way of looking at things or expressing things or even exploring things. And I, I think a very simple example is maybe the, the way how we have uh, made portraits of people. I mean, there used to be the painting and then maybe the photograph and now we have a kind of a digital way of, of mapping a, a surface or some kind of image which is another face. And I think all these different techniques give us different results. And I think we should start to think how we want to use them and what kind of results they give us, rather than sort of saying one is more appropriate than the other one. And I, I think that would be much more helpful if we kind of take a step back and be much but more particular yeah. about but the thing incidences. Is, is, yeah, I mean, I don't think that's what's been claimed at all, is that there's one that's better or worse than another. I mean, it just, I think what both Mike and I have been presenting is to sh identify it as a, as a valuable and a tool with, um, with still um, maximum potential. I mean, by showing that, you know, surface generated by computation is, is just, you know, one tool. But you know, may, I, may I suggest that one maybe does some type of case study where one actually looks at a particular way of using it and seeing <coughs> what it throws up or what it generates. I mean, because I think when I, when I try to teach uh, first year students drawing, then I have to think very carefully what type of application I use in order to do so. Okay. And I think the results have to do with the outcome in the same way. I think you, you, it has to do with, I guess, with your light studies. And I but think that's I very think interesting to do. Okay. And I'll put the counter argument, if, if I may. If you study the end of a pig, you look at the hairs on a pig's ass, and you look at a piece of wood, you will never predict the painting of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. I think there are products of I think we could all agree on that. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I think just looking at a computer or looking at a rotary will not generate a precise knowledge of the kinds of architectures that are possible. And somewhere in between your uh, statement and mine would lie the truth. But I think we're both at kind of quite polar extremes. I think we are going to have to, I mean, I myself have to go and lecture. Um, but it's clear, I mean, that in a sense the, the issue has only been kind of slightly opened up. <coughs> I think the difficulty at the AA is both have, how to have the discussion which involves a theoretical assessment of the consequences of computing but knows perfectly well that we're in there and it's not going to go, go away. Uh, but also, you know, in terms of, of the consequences for the school, um, you know, thinking about your very interesting kind of proposal for, like, having kind of laboratories, um, you know, without any kind of feeling whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I mean, it, it does, of course, immediately raise the question that the capital costs are going to go kind of soaring up. I mean, up till, say, the early 90s, basically the kind of capital costs of architectural education is zero. Um, someone's <laughs> going to observe, so I might as well do it, that if all these laboratories kind of, you know, were absolutely vital, perhaps we should have joined Imperial College in the first place. I mean, you know, not because I want to join Imperial College, but, you know, it becomes the kind of issue and now the AA would have to find some way uh, of kind of going down that path which both protects its independence but manages to get access to uh, kind of technology and, and forms of testing things you know, which, which don't kind of constitute an unbearable capital cost for itself. So it seems to me, you know, as always, I think it's extremely good that these things come in the form of proposals, but those proposals themselves need always to be, in some sense, folded into a kind of institutional view uh, of the school and its kind of independence, and in a sense, the limits to what it might reasonably be expected to do financially. Uh, I suggest that anyone who'd like to continue this discussion, if Charles and Mike 
a kind of happy, uh, should give their name to Belinda so that they can be kind of circulated when next meeting is. Um, since I've not asked Belinda uh, to do this yet, um, perhaps you could do her the courtesy of not asking her today um, until I've had broken the bad news that she's burdened with a further task. Thank you very much. <laughs>